turning dreams into reality. In the lab with the formula and chemistry. The memories spark and motivate and make the industry shake. We put the balls in the place. So for the one, one chance at best, yes. Painting pictures for the culture, keep the brushes fresh. Took the trouble, broke the drum, a passion never rest. Freedom is a teacher under pressure, now we bless. See, I was so good for the go. It's one art, one shot, now the future is yours. Go! Yeah! It's one all oh, one shot, now the future is yours. Go! Well, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining this episode of Gymnastics Growth TV. Thanks very much for those of you that were patiently waiting for this session to start. We just had a few problems with, uh, with our guests internet today. Um, it might be a Canadian thing, who knows, but we are up and running and very much looking forward to this session today. Really, really excited to introduce uh, this guest. Now, the, um, the relevance of this guest for me personally is, is quite huge, as many of you know, I was a recreational gymnast, so I didn't actually participate in any form of uh, performance gymnastics at all. Um, and I wasn't even interested in high performance gymnastics until I watched the 2004 Olympics, which is, well, was of course um, in Athens. Uh, now our guest today is relevant to me because I used to watch Carl Schufelt's floor routine over and over and over again because it is truly amazing and well deserved of the uh, Olympic title from 2004. So I'm super excited um, to be welcoming today's guest who is of course Kyle Schufelt from Canada, um, Canada's most decorated athlete. Um, not only is Kyle a triple Olympian competing at the Sydney Olympic Games uh, plus Athens plus Beijing, he is of course uh, Olympic champion, that's 2004 floor champion, plus a Commonwealth Games medalist and a uh, a world medalist as well. So an absolutely incredible career um, as an athlete, but he's also got on to do many amazing things uh, still within the sporting community itself. So I'm really excited to be welcoming today our special guest, who is, uh, of course, Mr. Kyle Schufelt. So let's head over to see Kyle now, and hopefully everyone can hear you and see you. Kyle, thank you so much for, for being here and, uh, and coming on Gymnastics Grove TV. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Nick, and congrats on all the amazing things you're doing, man. I follow along with your podcast, and I'm loving all the things you're doing. So thanks for putting out the positive message, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, it mean, means a lot to me. And uh, like I said, it's just it's just very cool um, that that you're here. And who, who you know, I never would have thought, however many years ago it was now, uh, since since Athens, you know, 16 years ago. Um, that one day I would be interviewing you um, on my gymnastics show and, and you being able to share your experience, not only as, a, as an entrepreneur, really, I would say, as well as a business owner, of course, um, and as a former athlete. So congr congratulations for everything that you've done. And I know that you're super busy at the minute with, um, with a lot that's going on. Let's start with your athletic career. That seems like a sensible place to begin, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. um, looking at those results, I mean, you know, three Olympics, Olympic champion, of course, uh, Commonwealth gold medalist as well, world medalist. You've got a vault named after you, of course, which is the Yachenko two and a half, um, which is amazing. You know, when you look back at that, um, you know, what are the immediate thoughts that pop into your head? Was that really me? <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this different version of myself, this superhero of your version. Yeah. And I can remember being a little kid starting gymnastics and these are all of the things that I wanted to achieve and I admired so much in others. And it feels very surreal even to this day to, to think that I actually got to do all of those things and I accomplished all of the goals that I had in sport. The only thing I didn't accomplish was I never won a world championship title. Okay. And that was something I tried to use as motivation at the end of my career to continue to go, but yeah. it just didn't resonate or stick. But yeah, I'm pretty, I'm, I feel pretty lucky that I was able to have such an incredible career in gymnastics. Yeah, so this, this is a broad, very broad question here. And, uh, and Kyle was just dipped out, but don't worry. Kyle, Kyle will do this a couple of times. He'll kind of dip in and dip out. There he is, he's back. Uh, so so don't, don't panic, everybody. Um, Kyle, will, Kyle will reconnect every time. Um, my, my next question to you is, is a very broad question, but what do you think was the main contributing factor to you having such an incredible career? You know, if you had to highlight two or three things, what, what do you think they would be? I think the first thing was that my career was athlete driven, parent coach supported. I was the one sitting in the front of that bus holding the steering wheel. I knew the direction that I wanted to go. Mm. It was my dream and I was chasing it and I had an amazing 
coach who was there to support me, encourage me, build me up and to help me along in the journey. And I had parents who paid the bills, who worked the bingos, who volunteered at the gym club and who were there to support this crazy dream that I had. So I think those are yeah. really strong contributing factors. And, and I also, I think that I, I was very naturally talented and gifted in gymnastics. It came to me really quickly. I, I did a lot of other sports when I was growing up, but gymnastics was the one that I fell in love with and it, I had passion for it. And, and I, I loved it so much and it was easier for me to learn things than I think a lot of the other students in, in my group. Okay. And so that I think carried me along as well. Okay, so it's, I mean, it sounds very fairy tale. You've got yourself as a young, driven, passionate gymnast. You're talented. Mm -hmm. You've got a great coach, Kelly Manjack, of course. You've got uh, loving parents that support you. It all sounds incredible. So um, I'm sure that wasn't the reality as such. I mean, you, you, you had all of that going on, but it wasn't an easy journey, of course, to winning uh, an Olympic title, was mm -hmm. it? So what are some of the struggles that you had to go through, would mm -hmm. you say, um, in order to, to get to that level as well? Oh man, there was, there was a lot of struggles. But the, the funny thing is, is the older and more removed you get from the sport, you start to forget about those struggles a little bit. When you're in it, it's like the end of the world when you have a bad day at the gym because it's the center of your life. And I can remember quite often. Um, Again, don't worry, guys. Kyle will drop back in. Um, I'm very sorry. Here, we're back. We're just going to take pauses and breaths. I want everyone to stand up and do five jumping jacks every time this thing pauses. I don't know what's going on here in it's Canada. Anyways, um, yeah, when you're a kid and you're a gymnast growing up and a bad day seems like the end of the world. But one thing that Kelly always told me was that I was able to turn bad days into good days. Okay. And I didn't dwell on it. I would come up with a plan that night. I would obsess over it and I'd figure out a way to show up the next day and make it better. Um, I broke bones, I broke my wrist, I broke my foot, I broke my fingers, I landed one time on my neck on the bar. Like injury, of course, is mm. a part of sport. Um, and I think you struggle with motivation. My teenage years were quite difficult. When I was 13, 14 years old, I had a bit of a rebellious streak and I wanted nothing to do with authority and I wanted to find my independence. And it, it, was, a, it was a roller coaster ride the whole way. Good day, bad day. Um, loving gymnastics, hating gymnastics, all all in the same week, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Kelly a couple of times. Obviously, a, a massive mm -hmm. part of your journey as as your coach. Um, did he coach you right from the beginning, or did you have other coaches earlier on, and then you moved to Kelly at, at a later stage? So I started um, in the recreational program, yeah. and I was in it for a couple of sessions. And then um, one of my coaches, his name was Brian, and he Kelly was the competitive men's coach at the mm -hmm. time at Alcador Gymnastics Club. And so Brian was like, hey, I've got this little kid. He's six years old. He can do a round of back handspring, and he taught it to himself in his backyard. I think you need to see this kid. Mm -hmm. So Kelly came, and we met on that day, and he did some testing and stuff. And then we went out, and he talked to my mom, and I was in, in his group. So he coached me from the time I was six until Athens when I was 22. Uh, he was my, I call him my career coach. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the mindset that you had, your, your approach to be able to, you know, cope with adversity in terms of the injuries and, and all the struggles on the way, would you attribute a lot of that to, to Kelly as your coach? Or would you say that mostly came from your parents and was reinforced by your coach? And again, we'll just wait for uh, Carl to reconnect again. There we go. You're back in the room, buddy. Um, I'm yep. sure if, if you heard the, the question there, it was about um, would you attribute your mindset, your approach to tackling adversity and your work mm -hmm. ethic to Kelly? Or was it a combination of your parents and Kelly? What, what did that look like? I think it was the trifecta. I don't think any athlete can be successful without the coach, the parent and the athlete. But I think the athlete has to be the driving force. And for me, I equate it to like a meditation. Uh, I had this goal and I always came back to it like it was my breath no matter what was going on and all the struggle and the hardship and all, all the other things in the world around me, I always came back to that goal. I, it pulled me along like a minute. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to win the Olympic Games. I wanted, I felt inside of me that that was possible. And I never let that, I never relented on that. Yeah. And so Kelly was always there to support it. My parents were always there to support it, but I was the one who... I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let that dream die. And the people around me weren't going to let it die either. But they never forced me to do it. They never pushed me into it. It was always me like pulling them along. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. I watched your, your TEDx talk earlier, which was fascinating, by the way. Mm. Um, I really I really enjoyed that. And congratulations for doing that, because I know that's, that's obviously a big deal as well. Um, mm. You mentioned in there that even at seven years old, I think it was, or, or perhaps I've got the, the age wrong, but you'd already mentioned when someone asked you the question, you know, what do you want to do when you're old? You're like, you know, mm. win the Olympics, of course. Again, where, where did that come from? Were you watching the Olympics on TV? Were you inspired by something else? Because, again, it's, it's incredible for you to have this, this mindset. Um, mm -hmm. It's always interesting to, to go back a bit and say, well, actually, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. I think that it came from um, the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona or the lead up to it. There was an athlete at my club. Um, her name was Jennifer Wood, and she was actually the first gymnast from the province of Alberta here in Canada to qualify to the Olympics. couple of seconds for Carl to come back. There we go. And we're back. Yep, yep we're back. So and so, yep. yeah, yeah, so Jennifer qualified to the 92 Olympic Games, and I got to see the process of her trying to qualify for that. And I got to see the hard work, and I got to see the perseverance and the struggle and the joy. And in there was something that ignited inside of me, this spark. I was, I wanted to be an Olympian because she was. And to see her compete at the Olympic Games really made me believe that maybe I could do that too. She showed up to the same gym I did every single day. She tumbled on the same floor I did. And that, that is really where that belief led off. And then the 92 Olympics were the game changer for me. I was obsessed. And watching gymnastics on TV, I would have my finger over the remote ready to press record and pause. I couldn't have commercials in my videotapes. And I just wanted to be like... I wanted to be like Kim Zemeskel. I wanted to be like Chris Waller. I wanted to be like uh, all the best gymnasts at the time that were shown on television. I wanted to be in that world. And you made it, which is uh, yeah, and I made it. Um, unbelievable, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. So you, you retired after Beijing? Right? I retired so, after Beijing, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you opened Carl Schufelt Gymnastics, which is, of course, your, your gymnastics facility, which is aimed at participation in grassroots, right? That was in Absolutely. 2013. What kind of happened in between there? Did you have a complete break? Were you coaching or what was going on? Yeah, so um, transition out of sports is, was really difficult for me. Um, there's some athletes that can do it quite quickly and easily. But for me, I spent my whole life being a gymnast and uh, identifying as that and uh, defining myself as that. You know, when you get on an airplane or in an elevator and you meet someone new and they say, oh, what do you do? And I, w I was a gymnast. Yeah. So it took me some time to figure it out. And I did lots of other things. I did my yoga teacher training. I studied for my real estate license. I went back to school and I studied business and broadcasting. I was working in television, um, doing the sports commentary for gymnastics on Canadian television. Nice. Um, I was... A few seconds and we'll be back. Uh, I appreciate everyone's again. patience, dude. That's so easy. sorry. It's nothing. So it's I, four, I was seconds. doing lots of things. We we started a gymnastics festival in Calgary um, with my name on it, and I was planning for that. And I, I was doing a lot of things, Nick. I just wasn't gymnastics wasn't at the center of my life. I was trying to define myself in other places. But it was after the 2012 Olympics where I went and commentated. I got home and I had really nothing on my calendar and I was waiting for my next gigs. You know, I was doing speaking, but I would have to wait to be booked. I would have to be a uh, wait to be booked for um, uh, event hosting gigs or for television stuff or whatever it was. And I needed a constant in my life. And it was almost like serendipitous that one day I went to do a, um, I went to like this corporate interview kind of thing um, with a recruiter and I was going to get a corporate job. I Maybe I was going to work in like community investment or something. And it just felt so wrong the whole time. I felt like I was making up answers to try to fit what they wanted me to be. And I walked home from downtown that day and I got home. And during that walk, I was like, I need to open a gym. Like I want to contribute to my community. I want to, I love gymnastics. I need to share this. I want to run a business. I want to be an entrepreneur. So it all, it, it kind of came to me. And the moment I decided to dive off the edge of that diving board, it became real. And we started looking for spaces and I started building my team. And it was about a year process from the moment that I decided it until we actually opened the facilities doors. That's quite a short time as well for, for opening a gym. So that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And I guess, I guess you've never looked back since because uh, I mean, it certainly looks like a, an impressive organization in terms of the facility, yeah. but also, you know, I love the branding, the marketing, and I really love the philosophy and the message behind what, what you're doing. So you're really focused on the participation level, aren't you, in grassroots gymnastics? 
Yeah, I, I didn't want to open a high performance center. I know that's what I wanted for my life and my career. Yeah. As a couple of seconds again. Thanks again, everyone, for your your patience as we get Kyle back. And there he is yeah, again. Yeah. yeah, here we are. That's that's what I wanted, but that's not who I am on like the outside. That's what I am as an athlete, but I'm a very fun, loving person who just wants to like have a good time and teach cartwheels and handstands. And I strongly believe that gymnastics is the base sport. It is the foundation. If a kid does gymnastics, they can transition into any other physical activity with ease. I see it every single day. I also felt that as a high performance athlete, I would kick 20 rec kids off the floor so I could do my floor routines that day. And I didn't want that environment of hierarchy. I wanted a place where everyone could be equal, where there was no pressure and deadlines of competition and where we could just treat gymnastics as that foundation sport that it deserves to be. We get kids who come into our facility who have the potential. I can see it. That little kid walks in and they can do the splits and five chin ups and they're six years old or whatever. I am glad to send them to another club in the city that can better serve them. And I am happy to have that conversation with the parents, but we were the foundation and we're really, really proud of that. Yeah. And, and it looks like you're doing an amazing job. Like I said, I, I keep yeah. a close eye on your social media stuff because it's uh, I just love, love the brand as well as the message. So again, congratulations. It's a, Thank it's you. an awesome stepping stone forwards. And, and if we it's look really at uh, another stepping stone recently, of course, you've, you've, um, you've just completed your, what I believe is your first book. Um, it's mm -hmm. not published just yet. Um, and it's called Make It Happen. Mm -hmm. So what was the motivation behind writing a book? And of course, we don't want you to delve into it too much because, you know, yeah. it's a secret before it's launched. But um, <laughs> do you mind just sharing a little bit about what the message of the book is and the intention behind yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been writing the book for 10 years, basically. And um, <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to write it, because I didn't want my stories <laughs> to be twirling around in my head anymore. I wanted to get them out on paper. There were some really valuable lessons that I learned in my. A few seconds. There Here we are. Go. Yeah. So there were some really valuable lessons and some really big difference makers from my coach, my parents, my sports psychologist, my physiotherapist, my teammates. There's so many characters that played a role in my career. And so I wanted to turn that into a story. So um, Blythe Lawrence, she's an amazing writer. So she, I asked her if she wanted to help me. I wrote out a, like 80,000 words and then I helped, Blythe helped me to kind of structure it into a, a book with a beginning, a middle and an end, not just a bunch of random stories. And the main central theme is about positive coaching. It's about treating your athletes with kindness. It's about um, you can reach the ultimate level of success in a healthy, happy, and holistic way. And it's not like everything is awesome. I had a lot of struggle and I share that struggle. I was bullied severely in high school. I share that. I broke both of my legs. I share that process. Um, I was teenage rebellion. I cover that. But throughout it, is the supporters that keep keep me on track, that keep me believing, that keep giving me tools and resources to chase that goal and that dream. And I'm very proud of it. The reason it's called Make It Happen is because that's what I said as I stepped onto the floor in Athens. On that day, I did win an Olympic gold medal. That's what I said out loud. And I had rehearsed that and practiced that in the months leading up. And that's what I was gonna say to ground myself, yeah. make it happen. I wanted to settle myself in a place of belief and confidence. And yeah, it, it's a book that I'm very proud of and I'm happy to share. And actually, it's going to come out next spring. Um, we were going to release it this year before the Olympic Games, but we're going to postpone it like everything else in the world's postponed. But I'm doing a chapter a night right now on Instagram Live, just reading the book because I'm too excited. I got to share it. No, it's been really, really fun. I'm, I'm sure. And uh, again, congratulations. I know it's not an easy task writing a book. I've, I've not done it myself, but I've got friends that have done that. Um, we're going to, again, we'll just wait for Carl to come back. There we go. I was just saying, Carl, congratulations, because I know that it's not an easy task writing a book. And whilst I haven't written one myself, mm -hmm. I've got many friends and business friends that have done, and they said it's, it's not an easy journey as, at all. So congratulations for that. Um, and I would certainly, uh, certainly do look forward to getting ha my hands on a copy when it is released. Uh, I'll certainly look forward to doing that. And maybe we'll get you back on the podcast again to discuss it at that time. 
um, be great. You've mentioned here a lot of really good stuff which resonated with me. Um, you said about happy, healthy and holistic, which is interesting because my philosophy is happy, healthy and hungry to learn, which is three yeah. H's as well. And, um, yeah. and so that's really yeah. cool that we're, again, um, you know, very closely linked there in our, in our beliefs and philosophies. The, the positive culture, the positive uh, experience, positive coaching is a very hot topic at the minute and quite rightly so. Um, yeah. The sport's obviously going through like a transition period when there is a lot more attention now on the way that people are coaching. And I talk about this a lot about what I, what I say, the um, the knowledge quadrant. In fact, I've got a picture that you won't be able to see, unfortunately, Carl, but I bring it up on, on screen here. Um, it's the, the knowledge quadrant. It's about knowing yourself as a coach, knowing the athlete, knowing the sport, of course, and also knowing how to teach. And a lot of coaches just focus on knowing the sport um, and they often neglect this area of basically knowing yourself, knowing the athlete, and most importantly, knowing how, how to actually teach gymnastics, you know, teach it in an inspiring way, in an ethical way, in uh, a way that creates a close bond. And it's, it's amazing that you've got so many stories and great memories of your time with, with Kelly and your other coaches um, to, to use, I'm sure, as examples you know, in, in the book as well. Where do you think it has kind of gone wrong in the past, you know, where it's been too outcome focused rather than process focused. What led the sport in some areas, of course, not everywhere to go in that direction, do you think? Well, I think the Olympics are glamorous and glorious and you have these coaches that are bigger than life, you know, who are getting all this attention and they're, they're achieving the results. And so it's about the coach and it becomes less about the athlete where the athlete is actually the one out there competing and doing the work. And so that's ingrained in us to believe that that's the way that we have to be. And I strongly feel that there is a way to be demanding. Like Kelly was not an easy coach on me. He wasn't just like, Oh, Kyle, you're so lovely. Like he was like, you have to do the work and you have to get it done. He was demanding, but he wasn't demeaning. He didn't use his power over me or his authority over me to make me fearful of him. And I think that's where our sport has gone wrong, is coaches are using power over children to make them fearful in order to get them to do the work. And that's not leading anybody anywhere. We need to fill our toolkit with resources where we can be positive and demanding together. It is possible. It absolutely is possible to... Um, hold, a ca hold an athlete accountable to getting the work done, but not telling them that they're stupid if they don't do it or that they're worthless. We have to work together. Some days are good days, some days, some days are bad days. And you have to, the scales are always tipping and always balancing, but you always should be moving forward. A I... couple of seconds again. Just to reconnect, Kyle. For those just joining us, Kyle kind of dips in and out yeah, every yeah, every few good. moments, but yeah. it only takes a couple of seconds. We need to be we need to be creating experiences where athletes want to be involved in the sport afterwards, and that should be always our thought. You know, Nick, as I think about a lot of the the past, I think there's a lot of us that have seen things that haven't said things, and myself included. And I want to be better. I have seen coaches demean athletes. I've seen young women standing on the balance beam with sweaty palms for 30 minutes as their coach yells at them and berates them and tells them that they need to do their back handspring layout series and won't let them get off the beam. But the reality is, is it's not going to be productive. Mm -hmm. When that young woman does that, it is not going to be for herself. It's going to be for her coach. And that's wrong. We need to have the athlete. We need to pull up the inspiration within themselves to want to do that so that they can move forward and be better. And some days it's just not going to work. And we have to accept that and move on and make a plan to be better the next day. So that's what I want to advocate for. I stand beside everyone and behind everybody who has ever had a negative experience in the sport to all of the survivors of anything that's been emotional, sexual, verbal abuse. And I want to move forward and create a better culture. That, that's what I want. That, that I feel is a role that I want to partake in now. Absolutely. And uh, I certainly share that vision and that mission. And um, uh, I think, you know, strength in numbers, the more of us that can be uh, tooting the same horn and, and shouting the same message, um, the better. And th thanks for those words, Carl. There's a lot of amazing value in there, um, you know, demanding, not demeaning. And I think, you know, when we talk about positive coaching, uh, 
maybe there's this negative connotation that people think it's fluffy coaching but as you've just mentioned it's it's not you know it can still be demanding it, you know to be doing anything at a level of excellence is not easy there is mm-hmm. adversity there is struggle there's days that you don't want to do things it's hard work um you know you might need to put pressure on these athletes to to work <laughs> when they don't want to. Let's wait for Carl to come back again. And we're back. Um, yeah. But that still comes from a place of care, doesn't it, Carl? You know, it's, and it's, it's not okay to justify, uh, you know, the shouting, the screaming, the, you know, berating an athlete and saying, oh, it's because I want them to do well. There, <laughs> it doesn't quite work like that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess a lot of that coaching is driven by ego and fear, of course, that mm-hmm. the coach feels like they're not in control. Um, you know, they're fearful of what's going to happen if the athlete doesn't perform their program and do their routines and go to a competition. You know, coming from a place of fear makes the coach then coach with their ego and think a little bit too much much about themselves, as opposed to, of course, what the athlete needs in that moment. Um, so I particularly what you, what, like what you said there, it's, it's not about coaching in a fluffy way. You can still be demanding, but, but doing this in an ethical and supporting way mm. and supportive way for the athlete. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, Nick, it's really important. One thing Kelly always did for us was he created measurables. And for coaches to do that, that allows the athlete to play a role. You know, we would have to count the number of skills we did in a day and that wouldn't motivate us. And it would inspire us to try to be better and try to do more than our teammates. And there was a little competitive environment, but we were tracking it and we would make out a plan. Kelly and I would sit down and do our periodization and I got to have a say in it. He wasn't just like, okay, today we're doing this and this and this. He would check in with me. How are you feeling today? And he, this was the best thing he always did. He would let me know. And Edward Yara of our national coach would always let us know what the assignment was the night before. We never got surprised. We were never blindsided. We'd never show up at the gym and all of a sudden have to do six routines. It was like, okay, tomorrow you have to do two hit routines back to back. That is your assignment. Prepare yourself tonight for that. So we got to eat well, sleep well, rest well, have like a good massage, get ourselves ready for that, to go in with that fighter mindset that day to do it and take ownership for ourselves. It was never springing surprise and holding us to something that we didn't know of. And those couple of seconds. And those are the things. Those are the things I loved, and the things that I miss most about sport now being retired is having those measurables and having that accountability, and and knowing when something big was coming up. I love that feeling of adrenaline, man. That night before I competed at the Olympic Games, I was like just visualizing and dreaming, and I missed the I missed the butterflies. I guess it's difficult when you're not on your own as a business owner. I'm sure you've got support around you, of course, but you might not have someone above you in the business, which is holding you accountable and setting these metrics for you. So I can imagine that's difficult. It's the same with me, to be honest with you. I, you know, run this company um, not quite on my own. I've got a small team, but but ultimately where this company goes is down to me. If I don't get out of bed, there's no one telling me off <laughs> for that. If I don't do a Facebook Live one day, it's just down to me. And so uh, I, I completely understand yeah. what you mean about accountability. Yeah. Just want to yeah. come back to the, the mantra, make it happen, because you said that was something that you practiced in the build up, of course, to your performance as well. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about accountability here, which is why I've connected those two. Again, did you come up with that mantra or did that come from somebody else? It was from me. Okay. Um, yeah, I... I... I was a very meditative athlete. I journaled a lot. I wrote because I had so I have so much going on in my brain all the time. I'm always thinking it never turns off. And so I have to write in order to like get it out of my head. And one of the things I thought a lot about was at the 2002 Worlds, I was really focused on the outcome. I was really focused on winning the world championship title. And I actually fell right on my butt in the middle of my routine in the semifinal. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, thinking about winning, that's probably not where you want to be. And then the next year at Worlds in 2003, I was thinking about like, you know, I belong here. I'm a good gymnast. Like that was kind of my motto. I'm a good gymnast. And then at the Olympics, it was about, it was no longer about the outcome. It was about the performance. It was not about the gold medal. It was about the way I was going to step onto the floor, feel present, feel settled. Here we are. We're back. It was about it was about stepping onto the floor and feeling confident and feeling settled and just kind of knowing that I had done the work. And the the thing that kept flashing in my mind was make it happen. Like 
It is here. This is your chance. Just make it happen. Walk into this. Be present. Let it flow. I don't know. If for everybody, it's different. But for me, that resonated. And, and so I, I, I hung on to it and I practiced it in the build up to the Olympic Games and used it on that day. If you watch the video on YouTube, you can see me say it out loud. Make it happen. And it worked, of course. <laughs> yeah, it did. Which is always nice. Um, yeah. Okay, Carl, we're going to be back in just a moment. Um, what I'd like to do, guys, is just ask you, whilst you're watching this, it's a great conversation with Carl, really enjoying this. If you can hit the share button, I'll be really grateful because then we can obviously get these positive messages spread out to the wider gymnastics community. If you've got a question for myself or Kyle on this topic or anything else, please just drop it in the comments section and we will get back to that in just a few moments. Now, whilst we're just looking through any comments that you send through um, and giving Carl a quick breather, I'm going to show you a little bit of information about the Gymnastics Growth Academy, my brand new membership and mentorship program. Here we go. Are you keeping a watchful eye on your athlete's adaptations? This is a program that your athletes will perform every single training day and is used to develop their level of baseline conditioning. We want the shoulders to be open. That's it, very good. The body nice and long, that's good. We're trying to isolate the top of the back, build the pyramid of preparation. The higher the skill level, the more unstable the tower or the athlete will become. I'm giving you the recipe, you just need to choose the ingredients. That might be an element, it might be a routine. From here, find your chest. This is connection drill. We want the athlete to have a really balanced push and pull ratio. And we are live. Welcome to the Gymnastics Growth Academy live broadcast. Be the best version of you because that's all you can control. Cast to handstand, upper body weight transfer, eight and 15 repetitions. He's sickling in this foot. Make sure that's clean and classy. Nine and rest, good. So our job as coaches is to ensure the athlete fulfills their long-term potential. Anything is learnable and that's what this academy is about. Just commit to being the best version of yourself possible. Until next time, raise your standards. So that is the Gymnastics Growth Academy, my membership and mentorship program, where we've got over 200 coaches now from 19 countries in the academy, experiencing lots of education and resources. We've got uh, regular weekly educational videos. We've got some Facebook Lives in there. Uh, we've got a massive amount of community discussion going on in the Facebook group. Loads of value from coaches all over the world. Like I said, 19 countries, including Canada, which is where our guest today, Kyle Schufelt, is obviously from. We're going to go back to the conversation now and speak to Kyle. Um, and I want to pick up Kyle straight away with a question that we've had um, just a few moments ago. And we were talking about positive coaching, of course, and the difference between being um, demeaning and demanding. Uh, a question here from Ian. Do you think being a strict coach is bad? Um, I think that everybody has their different styles and it, I don't exactly know the definition of strict coach, but if that's someone that's pointing out every little thing on every little turn, yes, I don't agree with that because I think the athlete has to be able to think for themselves. And I think a way to reframe being a strict coach is actually to ask the athlete, Hey, what did you think about that turn? or to video their turn and say, hey, is there anything you notice that could be better? Because what we're trying to do here as coaches is not create little robots that are just pointing their toes because their coach is telling them to point their toes. We're trying to create independent, strong human beings who believe in their ability to make good choices and to be independent. So I say try to reframe that so that the athlete plays a role in being strict on themselves. No athlete wants to hear a correction after every single turn. It's, you have to allow the athletes to feel it out a little bit. One thing that Kelly did for me was he would let me take several turns in trying something out, and he'd always ask me for my feedback. How did that feel? What did you try on that one that was a little bit different, allowing me to get to know my body? At the end of the day, the athlete is the one who's standing out there competing by themselves. You are there as the coach to get them prepared and ready, but if they can only rely on your cues, they're not gonna be able to survive out there in the wilderness of the competitive field. So set them up for success and let them play a role in being strict on themselves. Yeah, I think uh, amazing advice there. And when I think about the, 
the situational scenarios. Again, we'll just wait for Carl to come back in a couple of seconds. There we go. When I think about um, some of the scenarios we've, we've, we're facing as, a, as an industry, if you like, about, you know, unethical coaching, if you like, and uh, what leads some coaches to coaching in this overly strict manner, I think that a lot of those coaches have actually been gymnasts and they were coached that way. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they're, they're still in the same gym as well. So they've been an athlete in a gym. Mm -hmm. um, they've been taught a certain way. And so now they've got all these belief systems about how things are supposed to be done they transition into coaching in that same gym. And so mm -hmm. actually they've almost got blinkers on, blinders about the outside world and what coaching can actually look like instead. They mm -hmm. create these, these biases, but this is the way to do things. And it's just because that's all that they know, because that's how they've been, they've been taught as well. And breaking that cycle, I think, is difficult. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I think one of my, I mean, who knows whether this is the case or not, one of my, the greatest benefits, I believe, that... I have as a coach is that I wasn't an elite gymnast. I had no bias mm -hmm. coming into the sport. I just came in with a completely open mind. I didn't think I knew how something was supposed to be taught in terms of the, the teaching style. It was all new to me. And because of that, I think that was a great platform for my development as a coach because I, I, I had this mm -hmm. open mind and I could you know, cherry pick the things that I liked. Mm -hmm. I think there's an assumption that high level athletes are gonna produce high level athletes mm -hmm. and that's not the reality there's not a lot of olympic champions that go on to be coaches who produce like high level athletes yeah. um coaching is a skill and it's mm -hmm. a skill set that you have to continually work on to become better at so i love yeah I, I love that you were a rec athlete that was kind of where kelly was at too yeah really? and I'd say, yeah 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 awesome yeah there's a, a quite quite a lot of high performing coaches actually that i that i know have, have come from a recreational background and and no no previous experience so it's uh, it is interesting it certainly um says that you don't have to be a high level athlete to be a high level coach so awesome um can we bring this fast forward now up to let's wait for <laughs> wait for carl to come back thanks everyone for your patience there we go <laughs> we're back doing i'm doing a robot dance in between okay. everything. <laughs> sorry friends no hey, you you carry on you can you can keep going um as i was just about to say we're going to bring this much closer to home now so 2020 uh olympics postponement of course that had to happen i think everyone supports that decision of course yeah. whether or not we had a choice about it or not um the fig have obviously um changed some of the eligibility requirements so to speak for next year so for the for the um Basically, new seniors next year will be eligible for competing in Tokyo. You've, you've been quite public about your perspective on this. You don't agree with that decision, uh, nor do I, by the way. So do you mind just sharing a little bit about that and where your what thoughts are with that? I think that the 2020 Olympics were postponed and moved to the year 2021 because of a global pandemic. But I don't think that the age should have changed. I think all of the rules that were set out should have been transitioned to 2021. I think that maybe I live in a bit of a naive world to believe that, you know, everything should be fair. <laughs> um, I, I, I fear for the athlete who could have held on for the year to make the Olympic team and would have been on an Olympic team in 2020, whose spot is going to be um, I don't want to use the word taken away, but whose spot will be used for a, an athlete who wasn't originally eligible for the Olympic Games. I just don't think that that's athlete-centered. I don't think that's an athlete-centered decision. I also do see it from the FIG's perspective that legally there are athletes who in 2021 are going to be of the age that they have set as a requirement. And so they also had a case with the court of arbitration for sport, for example, that why shouldn't they get to compete? But it would have been easy to just say, all rules that apply to 2020, jump. Couple of seconds. There we go. Uh, I'm a traditionalist in that way. I believe, I think in Olympic cycles, and I, I just think it's gonna give some teams an unfair advantage, and I think it's gonna disadvantage, be a disadvantage to other teams. If you're keeping the code of points the same, then why are you not just keeping the age the same? That's that's my opinion. And I also highly disagree with the fact that they are using the qualification results from the World Cup um, instead of moving and doing the meet over again. Mm -hmm. I think that some athletes had to leave because things were going crazy and they had to get back to their home countries. And I think some athletes, myself included, 
I was always better in the final. Qualification, I just wanted to get through. I didn't want to win qualification. I wanted to win the final. And so I think you're putting some athletes at a disadvantage disadvantage in terms of their points. And I think that the the um, meet needs to be redone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll be interested to hear what the, the viewers think about this um, situation as well. So if you've got some thoughts on it, please drop it in the comments. Um, and we'll see if any of those come in. We've got another question here from Ross Falsetta. Now, a um, bit of context here, Carl. Ross Falsetta. He's my best friend. We grew up together. We did recreational gymnastics together. We learned to coach together. We traveled and um, have traveled the world together. Um, and we both sat in my living room when we were younger watching you on TV. And I spoke to Ross yesterday and he was also incredibly excited to, uh, to have you on Gymnastics Growth TV today. So um, thanks for watching, Ross. He's got a great question here. Um, he's doing a great job in a, in a, a head coaching role at a, a major club in the UK. He said he's in the transition of refining and defining the culture within the WAG program. In your experience do you think it's something that happened naturally in your time as an athlete or do you feel the coaching team basically got together and designed the culture that happened in the gym i think it is a design thing and i think it's something that has to continually be revisited i think it's something that's ever evolving i know culture isn't something that just happens because you put it on a piece of paper and say it's going to happen. It's something that you have to work at. Everyone has to be on board with and something that the target, it's always going to shift and change as things evolve. I know at my gymnastics facility, every year we have some new coaches who come in and we can tell them what the culture is, but they have to become a part of that culture. So what we actually do, this is maybe a suggestion I have, is we sit together as a group at the beginning of every year and we define what our culture is going to be. What are our values? Who are we? How do we stand up? How do we have these conversations? We call it designing our alliance. As a team, we design our alliance. And every year it changes a little bit as um, coaches and staff ebb and flow. Um, but we get to decide who we're going to be and how we're going to hold each other accountable to that. And we have those tough conversations. If I see you coaching an athlete in a certain way that I don't agree with, how can I come up to you and say to you, look, you need to keep yourself in check without it being offensive or without you getting your ego hurt? Like, how do we, how do, we do that? Or if everybody's sitting around, how do I as a business owner walk into the gym and say, everybody get up on your feet without you being piss off at me and rolling your eyes. So we come up with little things. One year we had a code word. So if I walked into the gym and people were sitting down and I wasn't like feeling good about that, I'd walk in and I'd be like, yo guys, it's bananas in here. And then they'd all whoop, get up on their feet. Bananas was the code word. Everyone knew what it meant and everyone got up on their feet. Generally our coaches are standing on their feet the whole time because they're coaching an hour and a half rec class. Yeah. But that was something we defined in our culture. We are not a sitting down looking bored culture. We are on our feet, hands on, spotting, engaging, high-fiving, giving fist bumps. That's what we wanted to be. And so how do we hold each other accountable to that? So to answer your It's something you must define and it's something that you have to continually work on and have conversations around. Nice. I, my, um, my additions to that, and I think what well, you've just basically said it, is that you wouldn't coach an athlete by dictating to them one time a year what you need them to do. It's an, on, <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. You know, you're, you know if, if you need tight legs, you don't sit down at the start of the year only and plan the fact that you're going to need to have straight legs. It's something that you're doing yeah. all the time. You're constantly yeah. talking about it and finding ways to manage it and get it right and refine it. And you might change the strategy but the, yeah. the destination is still straight legs. So you might go around this direction or this direction, yeah. but yeah. you're going to keep working at it. And of course, when you do get it, hopefully you'll, you, you'll be you know, praising and encouraging the athlete and reinforcing what they've done as well. Um, and doing the same for your coaching team. Yeah, if you exactly, see yeah. someone doing great, you, you go up to them and you say, I want to acknowledge that you are doing an incredible job holding yourself accountable to being this and that and that, right? And celebrating it, going out and like taking your team out for a fun night because everyone's rocking it, you know? People, people love being rewarded and people love being recognized and acknowledged for their, for their effort. Yeah, it's, it's catching people doing things right, isn't it? As well as always yes. looking for doing things wrong. And we're very good at that as, as coaches. It's always looking for where are the deductions, where's the mistake, yes. who's sitting down. Yes. 
but actually, yeah, finding finding catching people doing things right is yeah. uh, well probably more powerful than it is um, sitting down. Um, Kelly and, Kelly had a really great analogy that yeah. you might appreciate. He used to say, "You don't. I'm not going to send you to the grocery store with a list of things not to get. I'm going to send you into that grocery store with <laughs> all of the items on the list that you need to get." So, his, a lot of coaches I have seen are like, "Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that." And it doesn't. Kids don't want to hear what they don't like. Tell them what to do, and then acknowledge when they do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like the sound of of Kelly's philosophies. Um, you know, can you just share a little bit about his coaching background as well? When we bring you back to the discussion, there we go, and we're back. Yeah, I was just asking. Could you, do you mind sharing a little bit about Kelly's background in coaching as well? Yeah, so Kelly was, um, he grew up in British Columbia. It's a province over from where I live. And he was a trampoline athlete. He was a recreational athlete. He was six foot one. So swinging on parallel bars and high bar was really hard for him. But he was, um, he loved the sport. He loved the sport and he wanted to produce high level gymnasts. So he started coaching um, and he had mentor coaches that he worked with that really taught him kind of the ropes. And he brought in Eugene Galperin, who was a great coach from the USSR who had lived in Canada. And Kelly was very bold and asked him to be his mentor coach. And so Eugene would come every summer to the Altador Gymnastics Club here in Calgary and work with Kelly. And they'd come up with the plans and they'd come up with all the charts and all the things for the whole year. And uh, yeah, Kelly was always a coach looking to learn and looking to grow and admiring the great things other people were doing and trying to, figure out how to implement that into our training program as well. So yeah. that's a bit of his background. Mm. And now he coaches in Ontario. So um, he coaches women's gymnastics and he yeah. opened his own gymnastics club in 2013 as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's Manjax, is it? Is that right? Manjax Gymnastics, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, I, what I find amazing here is the kind of the ripple effect that, um, that someone with that mindset has. So Kelly's gone to get a mentor because he's got the right mindset Kelly's working with you, you know, seeing you most days. You've got that mindset because, of course, you're, you're sharing so much time with this person who's open minded. Kelly's massively impacting the way that you think and your perspective on, on life and adversity and, and all that. And then you're now doing that and spreading all that inspiration and mindset as well to other people that are in your community. And of course, that's going to influence them and influence the people that they influence. So I just find that ripple effect is really powerful that um, we all just have this amazing ability to contribute and and to make a difference. You know, I hate the word influencers, you know, like on Instagram, right. so I want to be yeah. an influencer. Right. Everybody is an influencer. Let's just wait a moment for Carl to come back. There we go. Yeah, everybody is an influencer. We've all got that power, mm -hmm. <laughs> whether we well, whether we carry the label or not. And you don't need, you know, five hundred thousand followers on Instagram and be doing squats. Don't want them. Don't in, want in, in them. order to be an influencer, <laughs> we've we've all got that ability, and and we've all got yeah. that power within us as well to to really contribute yeah. and to really make a difference. And so um, it's just always interesting thinking, and that's why I asked the question: you know, what, was, what was Kelly's background coaching? And yeah. I want to know who coached his coach as well, because it, that's that's where it all begins. Mm -hmm. Positivity is like a pandemic, you know. <laughs> you can spread it, and then yeah. it just continues to grow really fast exponentially. So, yeah, absolutely. Very, very cool. Carl, I have to say, um, I've really enjoyed this discussion today. So thank you so much for spending time with us here on Jumanji Express TV. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience with Carl dipping out a little bit and of course the issues that we had at the start. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this guys as much as I have. Carl, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we can catch up again soon. I'd love to do another episode when your book does come out and we can talk about it in a bit more detail. And uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to order my book as soon as that comes out as well. So congratulations for everything you've achieved and uh, wishing you luck with everything that's still to come. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. No problem at all, my friend. OK, everybody. And uh, thank you to you guys. Again, thanks for your patience for um, the dips in and out there of that discussion. And of course, the, the blip we had at the beginning of that session. But uh, like I just said, what an amazing uh, interview that was with, with Carl. Really enjoyed talking to him about his journey and, of course, getting an idea about his mentality and mindset, his approach to life, which has, of course, contributed and helped him achieve all of these results, not just in the, um, in the arena, if you like, but now as a business owner and everything that he's doing for the community as well. So um, really, really good to see. I appreciate everyone being here. We've got a couple of episodes of Gymnastics Growth TV next week as well. We've got a guest who I will allude to uh, early next week. And I'll be doing a session probably on Tuesday or Wednesday. I'd love to know what you would like to know about. 
Um, obviously, I offer uh, an extensive educational resources within the Gymnastics Growth Academy, but these sessions are also educational. So if there's anything that you'd like me to talk about or to find a guest to discuss, I would be more than happy to, uh, to consider your ideas. Please send them over. Uh, you can send me a direct message or you can just email me at nick at nickroddock.com. Um, just before we go, I want to make sure that you are aware of the masterclass recordings that we currently have available. There's over 22 hours of digital content which was filmed live from seven different events across a number of uh, apparatus from physical preparation to bars to floor vault all sorts of different apparatus over 22 hours of content there and there's literally over a thousand coaches around the world accessing that material and what better time to be scrubbing up on your technical skills whilst we're not actually in the gym so before we sign off i'm just going to show you a little bit of information about those masterclass recordings which are currently discounted at 50 percent off it's the first of six masterclasses. Today is all about vault and sprint development. Just very excited about the fact that we're all here together. People have a love for bars. I'm going to certainly demonstrate some of the passive and more active ways in which I would prepare something that's in contact with the floor constantly. Keep that hand close. Don't let me see your ears. Bent knees, closed shoulders, okay? Conversations about how you can take some of these ideas, implement it at home and improve the level of your athletes. How can we take young athletes and develop them on a high performance pathway. Jody's been one of the top coaches in the UK, produced multiple athletes on the GB team. We want open chest, we want long spine, so we can create some extra tension on the top half of the hamstring. So the amount of swing that she has coming from the top bar is greater than what she has on the low bar. You're carrying the speed from the round off flick into a takeoff. All you're gonna do is send that rotation flying. You can have no chance at all. A bit higher, good. It's all in the same family of movement. There's no need to, to jam that hip shut. Do you see how knocking out that vestibular system and the eye focus changes how people balance? Stops it from getting boring. There's nothing worse than the, the, having a predictable program. But couple that with great energy in the gym, great motivation, high standards. All of that together, that's going to have an impact on your athletes. So that was the masterclass recordings available at nickroddock.com and because of this coronavirus pandemic we've discounted those by 50 percent so if you've got some spare time on your hands which i'm sure you have i'd really recommend going over and checking out some of those sessions thanks again for watching and i look forward to speaking to you next week again on gymnastics growth tv thank you very much have a great weekend